Okay, good morning all. Uh, can you all hear me and can you all see my screen? Are you all able to hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, so this week's tutorial will be looking at the assignment, your calculation report. Um, this uh, tutorial needs to be, be a little bit more interactive than uh, our normal tutorials. So before I start, I just want to know, have you all started the assignment? And if you have, uh, what step are you up to? Where are you up to? I understand uh, some students haven't uh, started yet. It's June week 14, so we still have lots of time to work on it. But I just want to know, uh, for those of you who have started, if you're facing any difficulties with any of the steps involved in the assignment. And if you are, uh, please let me know now so that I can focus on those areas in this tutorial session. Do you guys have any difficulties or anything you're not quite sure on or don't quite understand? No difficulties? Okay, for this week's uh, tutorial, your attendance will be taken based on your interaction in the chat or via speaking through your microphone. Okay, there won't be any activity uh, like previous weeks. This week, your attendance will be taken based on your interaction during the session. So before I jump into briefly talking about the assignment, uh, going over the assignment, uh, I just have a few questions that I would like you guys to help me answer. So this assignment, we're looking basically at uh, designing a part which will experience some form of uh, uh, force or stress when it's working during its functionality. It'll experience some kind of force or some kind of stress. And we are required to then design our part to be able to withstand those stresses and those forces. And of course, we have to factor in some kind of uh, safety to make sure that our part is actually safe, All right? So before we start, I just want to ask you guys, what are the types of forces that we can come across? In general, what are the types of forces that we can experience? Shear force, yes, so one is shear, 
Any others? We have one share force. Uh, please, if you have uh, asked uh, any of the questions or have any questions, please unmute your mic and uh, ask it. So one we have Shia, another one we have Tensile. We also have Compressive. And we have other things like Friction, uh, so on and so forth, okay? However, for our assignment, we're mostly focusing on these three, Shear, Tensile, and Compressive forces. Friction only comes into the, into the equation when we start to look at parts that are moving against each other. But in this case, there's no parts that are moving against each other. Our coupling just has to fit onto the shaft and transfer the power from one shaft to the other. Uh, normal force, yes, normal force is a type of force, but uh, normal force is usually either tensile or compressive. All right. So normal force, both of these can be counted as normal forces. If you look at it as in terms of physics, tensile and compressive uh, forces are normal forces. And shear is any force that causes the part to want to try and slice or slide. Right. Now, uh, how do we know when we've designed our part or when we're designing our part, if our design will be adequate, if it'll be strong enough to withstand the forces that it's going to experience? How will we know? How can we be sure? How do we know if our design is adequate enough? Because we, we can find the forces or we can identify the forces that we'll be experiencing, but then how do we then relate that to whether or not our design will be able to withstand those forces? Because of course, it doesn't matter the size of the force, you can make your part really, really big and really bulky. And of course, it'll be able to take the force. But what's stopping us from doing that? How do we know when our, ad, our design is adequate? The answer is we have to find a, a balance between making sure that our part is safe and making sure that we aren't exceeding the budget. We, have, we usually have two restraints or two limitations. And those two limitations are, of course, from the client will be the cost and from the consumer will be the safety. So those two things we have to consider when we do our designs and find a nice balance between the two, All right? So we have to look at safety. Safety is paramount and then cost is the second most important thing we have to look at. And when we talk about safety, we often have a thing called the factor of safety. And this is basically the relationship between the maximum, maximum stress that the material can withstand and the maximum stress that we will experience. So this is maximum stress of material and the relationship between the maximum stress during working or during its functional life. Okay. We have to find that nice balance. And majority of you guys are mechanical and civil students. So it's already been discussed in your lectures and already you've already been introduced to it before, but this graph, the graph of stress versus strain is basically your bread and butter where you have this something like a curve, something similar to this. You've all seen this before, I believe? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Yes, sir. So the stress strain curve, can anybody tell me yes, sir. Uh, the different zones on the stress strain curve? What are the different regions? 
what does this region tell us about the material? So each material has its own stress strain curve, okay? So what does this region tell us? And then what does this region tell us? Any ideas? These are the fundamentals for mechanical and civil. So you're just being introduced to it in 100 level. You've already talked, maybe touched on the subject very lightly in your physics courses or in, even in high school, maybe even during a TD or applied technology back when you were in school. But from here on in, this is, this is almost like your Bible as an engineer understanding this curve and understanding what it means and what it represents. So can anybody tell me what this first region shows? It's called the elastic region. All right, and then what does that mean? What happens in the elastic region? Any ideas? Withstand force, um, yes, yes, sort of. So the elastic region for most materials, okay, when you stretch a material, say you take a piece of uh, steel and you stretch it, say this is a piece of steel and you apply some kind of force here and some kind of force in this direction and you stretch it, it'll grow a little bit, yes? Yes. This is called strain, when the length of the material changes. This change in length is called the strain. And it's directly relation, it's got a direct relationship to the amount of stress that you're applying. And in the elastic region, when you remove this force, when you take off the force, it will return to its original shape. So in the elastic region, it has a directly proportional relationship between stress and strain. As the stress increases, the strain will increase. In the elastic region, that's the relationship. As soon as you reach a point, the elastic relationship doesn't exist anymore. This point is called the yield strength. That is the maximum amount of stress or force that you can apply to a material where it won't deform. After this point, if you stretch it too much or you apply too much stress or too much force, the material, even when you take off the load, it won't go back to its original shape. And I'm sure you guys have all observed this in everyday life and all kinds of things. But, uh, you know, this is the actual technical terms where we start to talk about it, uh, stress and strain, their relationship. So once it goes beyond the yield stress, it plastically deforms. And in mechanical terms, that's called failure. We don't want our parts that we design to change shape, right? That's the thing that we're trying to uh, prevent. And that is how we tell whether or not our design is adequate. If the stress that it'll experience when it's working is less than the yield strength of the material, then we know that it'll be able to function uh, as it's supposed to without failing. However, if the stresses are greater than the yield strength, then we can assume that at some point the part will fail and we'll have to redesign. And that's just uh, extra cost and could potentially be putting clients or the public uh, in danger. So the yield strength is what we use to determine whether or not our design is adequate. And like I said earlier, the factor of safety is just a relationship between the maximum stress of the material. So the yield stress, so this is the yield stress and the maximum stress that we will experience when it's working. All right, so these are the fundamentals and using this, these bits of uh, fundamental understanding, we're supposed to try and approach the assignment. So I won't go through each one of the analysis. Uh, I just wanna ask you guys, is there any particular analysis that you aren't familiar with or you're not quite sure what to do here 
because we have five types of analysis. We have the talk, we have the key, we have the hub, we have the web and the bolt analysis. Uh, any one of those ones you're not quite sure about? How we, how we uh, actually go about doing it? The bolt analysis. Okay, sure. I'll I'll go over the bolt analysis. All right. So the torque analysis shouldn't be a problem. You just have your you're given your power in the question. You're given your power and you're given your revolutions, and the diameter. And using those bits of information, you can derive your torque. And the torque is the main guy that we have to try and solve for. Right. That's the torque analysis. We're trying to find what the torque is. Now, can anybody tell me the relationship between uh, if torque is kept constant? Because the torque is directly proportional to the power. So the amount of power that's been having to be transferred, that's the amount of torque that we have to transfer. So we are going to assume that we're trying to transfer 75,000 watts. So from part A to part B, we're trying to transfer that amount. So 75,000 in part A, we're trying to get 75,000 in part B. So the torque in part A should be equal to the torque in part B, which means torque will be constant, yes? So when torque is constant, what relationship does force and distance have? If the torque is going to be constant for all the analysis that we do, it'll have a directly proportional. directly proportional. So you're saying as the force increases, the distance will increase and the torque will stay the same. Uh, yes, Sean, it's an inversely proportional relationship. The further we get away from the center of this shaft, so as our distance increases, our force will decrease and vice versa. As we get closer to the center of the shaft, the force will increase. Sorry, the force will, yes, the force will increase. So as the distance gets smaller, the force will increase so that the torque can remain constant. All right. So then for each one of these analysis, you have to try and find the corresponding, to uh, corresponding force on those parts. So the, the torque will remain constant, the force will be changing and the distances will be changing. All right, that's no problem. So to answer your question, uh, Freddie, or to talk about the bolt analysis. All right, so we've already found, at this point, you should have already found your hub diameter. So you should have your hub outer diameter already predefined. Let's say that you find it's going to be 150 millimeters. Okay. The first step when you're going to do your, your uh, bolt analysis is you have to find out what your PCD will be. PCD is the pitch circle diameter or the distance from one, the center of one side of your bolts to the center of the other side of your bolts. What's that distance? Now we know that this circle in here is our hub. Our hub will be inside here. So our PCD, will obviously have to be greater than 150 millimeters. And we also have to account for accessibility. You have to account for accessibility. And when I say accessibility, I mean, if there are bolts and there are bolts and nuts, you have to be able to get a wrench or a spanner in there to be able to loosen or tighten your bolts. Yes. So the PCD is more of a logical choice by the designer. You could say that you want this distance from the edge of the hub to the center of your bolts to be, say, 100 millimeters, so 10 centimeters. OK. So then that multiplied by 2, because it's on this side as well, your PCD would be 150, your hub diameter, plus 200 millimeters. 
coming out uh, 250 millimeters. All right. But when you state that you need a distance of 10 centimeters from the edge of your hub to the center of your bolt holes, remember that that's quite a lot of distance. And the more distance you, you have between the edge of your hub and your center of holes, the more material you will have to have, the bigger your part will have to be, the more expensive it'll be to manufacture. So choose a realistic number. In this case, maybe 100 isn't realistic. Maybe 50 is more realistic. So maybe we should have changed this to be 50. In which case, your PCD would have been, oh, sorry, this would have been 350. In which case, your PCD would have been 150 plus 100, and it would have been 250. Now, this is a bit more realistic, a bit more logical. 50 millimeters on either side, so that's five centimeters. Lots of space to get a wrench or a spanner in there. So each one of you and each one of your calculation reports, you may come up with a different PCD. It'll vary for each group. There's no set uh, distance, but you have to justify uh, why you have set the PCD to be that distance. Okay. So once you set up your PCD, you then go about um, determining, you can go about, you can do this two ways. You can either say that I want to use five bolts, but I don't know how big to make each one of those bolts. Or you could say, I want to use a bolt this size, but I don't know how many bolts I need to use. So there's two ways you can go about it. There's two methods. Because the bolt analysis, you're, only, you're trying to find the size of the bolt and the number of bolts that you need. The first method you use is you state the number of bolts. And you solve for the diameter. Or the second method is you state the diameter. Solve for number of bolts. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, so once you have your PCD, you then can use two methods. You could either state the number of bolts that you want to use and then solve for the diameter of each bolt, or you could state that you want to use a bolt of this diameter, but you don't know how many you need for it to be able to function or for it to be able to withstand the stresses that will be, <clears throat> that will be involved. All right. Now, understand something, that these bolts will experience a shear force, meaning the force will be parallel to the cross-section of the bolt. If it's perpendicular to the cross-section of the bolt, then that is a, either a compressive or a tensile stress, a normal stress or a normal force. But with the forces being applied parallel to that cross section, by parallel to that cross section, I mean the bolt cross section is like this, it's a circle, and the force is acting in this direction and it makes the bolt want to slice in half. That is a shear force. And that shear force will be shared amongst the number of bolts that you have. So we know the relationship between stress and force. So shear. For uh, shear stress is equal to the force, shear force divided by the area, yes? Or stress is equal to force divided by area. You're all aware of this? This is the general relationship between stress and force. So we know the shear stress, or we know that the shear stress will be relate, related to the force divided by the area. And the area is the area of the bolt, so pi uh, r squared, area of the bolt multiplied by the number of bolts we have. So number of bolts 
the shear stress, we get that from our data sheet. Now, if we look here in the bolts, it said it's given in the description by the client that uh, the tensile strength is 240 megapascals. Now, we're not looking at tensile strength because we're looking at the shear force. So, shear force is being applied, so we have to look at the shear st stress or the shear strength. And if you read the fine print here beneath this table, which describes the types of bolts and the sizes, it says here the allowable shear strength of a steel fastener is about 0 0.66 times that of the tensile yield strength, which means our shear stress for our bolts. is 0 0.66 times our tensile strength. So our shear strength comes to 158.4 megapascals or 158 newtons per meter squared. Okay. So we now know our shear strength. And like I said, you can either say that you want to use five bolts or you can say that you want to use a certain diameter. So diameter is just radius, is radius is just diameter divided by two. All we don't know is the force. And the force, like you will have done for all your other steps, is directly related to your torque multiplied by your distance. And distance in this case is your PCD divided by two, or your pitch circle radius. And if you make your force the subject of the formula, you will have your torque, which will be constant for all. So 477.7, I think, divided by your PCD over two. You can find your force, and then that force you plug into this equation. You know your shear stress, so you plug your shear stress into this equation here. And you either trying to solve for R, like in the case of uh, one, you know the number of volts. So you put a number of volts here, you type, you enter five and you solve for R. Or using method two, you state that your radius should be, say, five millimeters, so 0 0.005 radius, and you solve for the number of volts. And that's how you go about doing your bolt analysis. Do you have any questions? Any questions? No, sir. No questions. Okay. Uh, is there any other section that you're not quite sure about? Sir, do we write explanations as well, or is it purely calculations? Um, so it's always useful to add some kind of uh, justification, all right? A calculation is all very good and well, but calculation doesn't tell the whole story all the time. So in this case, when you select your PCD, you would say why you've set that PCD to that distance. You have to account for the hub diameter as well as the distance or the accessibility of a wrench or a spanner. So you've said that it should be about uh, 50 millimeters either side. Okay, you would, you would include that explanation in your report. And Sunil, for the radius, do we take any random number? By radius, you mean uh, your PCD or your this radius down here in the torque uh, calculation? For the torque calculation, your radius is your PCD. So whatever you state at the beginning here, right at the beginning, what you say, whatever you say your PCD is going to be, that will be the one that you'll enter into your calculation for your torque. PCD divided by two will be your radius in this case for the torque calculation. Yes, 
Okay, so it isn't, it isn't, it sort of is a random number because you have to just assume or you have to say what number it is. Okay, there's no calculation to find your PCD, but it isn't random in the sense that you can just choose any number. You have to choose a logical number, a number that makes sense or a number that doesn't mean that you'll be wasting a lot of material. All right, so it isn't a random number, but it isn't a number that you have to calculate. Okay, and uh, to answer your question, Jemima, about uh, do we have to write explanations in our uh, calculation report? Yes, for certain things, you have to give some kind of uh, rationale or justification or explanation as to why you've taken this step, because there are certain assumptions you make along the way. All right, so like right at the beginning, before we did the whole calculation, we make the assumption that there are no impact loads, that we know that all the loads that will be exerted on this uh, coupling. We know that the torque is the only load that will be experienced. That's the first assumption. So we have to state that right at the beginning. Uh, when you come to design your hub, you have to include a factor of safety. There is a step there where you start to factor in your factor of safety. You have to state why you have used that factor of safety to calculate your hub diameter. Okay, you have to make these statements. You have to explain why you've made those steps. If not, then they're just numbers and they don't, ex they don't, because remember this whole assignment is basically we're trying to create a calculation report to then, as well as show it that it was, it is possible of working. We also have to present it to a client and a client maybe isn't so well versed with engineering terms or isn't so well versed with uh, mathematics or isn't able to function at the level that, that we are as other engineers, we'd be able to interpret the designs or interpret the, the calculations or make inferences based on the calculations. Sometimes you need to give a little bit of explanation as to uh, why you've made this assumption, uh, why you've said that you want to find the number of bolts and set the, instead of uh, solving for the uh, size of the bolts, or uh, why you've uh, decided to take this factor of safety into account. Okay, you have to, you have to uh, also give some kind of word justification along inside your calculation report. And do you have any other questions about any of the other analysis that we come across? Any other questions? Uh, do we write it down in the calculation report or do we just type in them as well? Um, try and set up the calculation report, the, the structure in MS Word and type it in that as well, okay? You get what I mean? You set up, you know, the sort of table format with the borders and the top with the title and all that, like it's given in the calculation report, the format. Now, since you can't give a hard copy submission, which is what, we, it, what it would have been if we didn't have this COVID situation, now you have to give it as a digital uh, submission. So try and create the format in Word and then type it inside that format. Remember guys, uh, 15 marks comes from, uh, comes from the calculation report and 10 marks comes from the drawings that you do. So the drawings are a very important part and you have to use AutoCAD to develop your drawings. Uh, web analysis. Okay, um, this session will actually end in one minute. So I will, Use the same password and the same uh, login that you use to join this session, and I'll start a new session uh, straight after this, okay? And I'll discuss the web analysis. All right? So, guys, I'll uh, see you there, part two of this uh, tutorial. Yes, sir.